I started this lecture, could I present to you this is a little plaque which, which uh, commemorates the Margaret Sinclair Award. So congratulations. Thank you very much. So now, we have the pleasure of listening to Chaudhary's lecture. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much for this uh, award. I feel uh, very privileged here hearing that Margaret Sinclair made a tremendous contribution to math education. I feel very honored to be here in front of her husband. And uh, very lucky at the same time, because I'm sure there's other people that uh, deserve this prize. So very humbly I accept it. Uh, when I was uh, asked to give this talk a long time ago, <laughs> five, six months ago at least, uh, I was thinking, what am, what am I going to talk about, you know? Math education, a lot of good teachers in this room. I'm not going to uh, ask the teach people how to teach. And I sort of asked myself, you know, how did it all start, you know? <laughs> how did I get interested in mathematics? Well, it goes back to elementary school. Uh, I was nine years old. I was in fifth grade. We started school at five years old at that time. And this teacher of mine was a nun. And she uh, wrote uh, equations on the board, and she was smiling and happy, and brought my attention to mathematics. And I, she gave me the passion for mathematics. I was only nine years old. So I was brought into mathematics by a human being, by a person. And then I questioned myself, what did I like in school further on? After primary school, secondary school, of course I like mathematics. What was my second favorite topic? History. I was fascinated by history. And what's history? It's all about people. So I figured, well, there's this human aspect of mathematics which we don't talk so much about. It's the human part of the equation. So this, I had this title in my head for four months and worked on this, <laughs> worked on this talk for all this time. Okay, <laughs> so my plan today, uh, I'll go through the plan quickly. Uh, of course, the uh, first question we'll ask here, who's good at math? Uh, and then I will explain that mathematics is a human adventure, and I will explain why. And that we need a lot of more smiling and happy faces <laughs> in the world of mathematics. You will see exactly, I'll show you graphically what I mean. And I would think that mathematicians don't only do mathematics, they also have a life. <laughs> they have problems and they have uh, situations they have to fight. I will talk about the fascinating process of mathematical discovery. It's about people. How do people do math? How do they discover, obtain all these results? It's very human, you will see. Uh, I will also talk about mathematics outside the classroom. Of course, I'll talk about the role of teacher, parents, and I will explain some math outreach experiences of my own. And finally, I'll talk about the TIM index, which you're probably sure nobody knows about. And I will explain uh, what it is and how we can... Okay, let's start with the first question. Very first basic question. Are we naturally good at math? And the short answer is yes. And uh, I found this, uh, this uh, book uh, written some time ago, Mathematical Brain by Brian Butterworth. He explained that we're all born with a core sense of card numbers. And we're essentially hardwired for basic number abilities. And he has a whole book about it. And one, one of the example he, he explains is that babies that are one or two weeks old, they have a sense of number. And the way they, they proved that, that they did this experiment, they had this little puppet animal and uh, this, uh, this lady would hide the puppet in the back, and another one hide in the back. And then, if she'd come up and show three puppets, the baby was kind of disturbed. They had <laughs> measurements of doing that. While if she came up with the two puppets again, it was, it was fine. That was a normal situation. <laughs> so uh, that's the starting point of them explaining that we're very, naturally, we, are, we have this uh, sense of the cardinal number and of math. Okay, nevertheless, some, many people are afraid of, of, of mathematics, okay? 
And, uh, well, why is that? Well, there's many reasons, and I'm not going to go through the whole list, but I'll just say a few. Uh, math is an abstract science, and it may at first uh, seem inaccessible, and in fact, uh, math op is often perceived as a science only for the elite, unfortunately, and it should be. Maybe the traditional way of teaching mathematics is inappropriate, and I'll say what the traditional way was when I was uh, in, uh, in high school and so forth. It, you know, would say the teacher is very a good teacher, a good mathematician. So well, now we got to do the basis and we got to do the definitions. We got to understand definitions, uh, terminology, and then the theorems, and and we never got to the application. If we got to them, we were poor motivation was gone. I think it's better way better to go the other way around. Start with the application. <laughs> Start with uh, something that depends on mathematics, like for instance, the GPS depends on mathematics, and then yeah, the kids are very curious, and then the, you build the mathematics from there. And you can do that for just about any topic. Start with cool application. And sometimes the attitude of parents towards mathematics, which have gone through this traditional teaching and don't have a good souvenir about mathematics. And sometimes I, I meet parents and they tell me, Oh, I was so bad at math when I was a kid, you know. I just hope, and I tell them, don't tell that to your kids. Because <laughs> they're going to do projection and say, oh, well, my parents weren't good at math, so how do well, you expect me to be any good at math? So sometimes, but uh, I will come back to parents later on. Anyway, whatever the motives, I think it's important to, to, um, to uh, explain that mathematics is also a human adventure. And... Uh, I say it's first and foremost in human Because when you think of it, mathematics is a field of knowledge developed by humans, the mathematicians, who prove these, who obtain these results and prove them. It's taught by human beings, teachers. And who is it taught to? It's taught to students, which are humans. So it's a human adventure all the way. And this, we should, uh, we should keep this in mind. And uh, as an example, I'll talk about girls in mathematics, which, girls and mathematics, that should be in mathematics. And that, this is the other study that I, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk about the, all the women, the issue in mathematics. I'm just going to talk about one research that really caught my attention, which is related to the topic of my talk. Is, uh, this, uh, th these are two different researches where I saw this essentially the same message. That girls essentially are good at an early stage, like the boys. Like I said, everybody comes up hardwired to do mathematics, no problem, and they naturally like it. But as they reach the graduate level, slowly they start looking for the human factor. And that's why many girls, which are good in science and math, end up not going in science and STEM studies, but they go in science, but health science, where there is obvious human contact, human, you know, the patients, and maybe the other doctors. And the, the, these uh, research say that, uh, unfortunately, they don't find a human factor. That was before they, my talk. <laughs> uh, okay, how do you uh, humanize mathematics in a sense? Talk about the people who initiate the math results. Most of the time, we don't care about that. We're really into the math, the rigor, and everything. And we don't bother explaining uh, who did that result. And uh, how did he get that result? Was, did he try twice? Uh, did, did, did he use somebody else's result? How did he manage? And it's all in the history of math, actually. That's, that's all available. It's out there, especially today with the web. Uh, you have the history of all the mathematicians. You have the history of all the topics in mathematics. And it's worth spending some time on them. And math, and, and it's important to show that math and science progress through trial and error. And this is very human. To try to do something, make a mistake, and there, and you try, you try again, and try again until you succeed. It, uh, it's very rarely that you get it at the right, the f very first time. And uh, also, that mathematicians find a lot of pleasure doing math, and they have passions outside of science. Okay, this human aspect, uh, uh, the history of mathematics is very important. Now, start with one anecdote about the mathematician, which you may have heard, that uh, was not a mathematician at the times, uh, Sophie Germain. How did she become a mathematician? 
Now that's, I'll talk about legends in during my talk. This. this is not a legend. This is a fact. She said, and uh, this is a picture of Sophie Germain, the 18th century mathematician. Uh, she said that uh, she decided to become a mathematician because she was moved by the story of the death of Archimedes. Archimedes, Archimedes, that is in English. And you know the story. Uh, Archimedes was, uh, uh, essentially was in the city of Syracuse, and the king of Syracuse wanted Archimedes to help him defend the city of Syracuse from the attack by the Romans. So the Romans were trying to invade Syracuse, and Archimedes had devised all these kinds of uh, counterattacks. There's a legend that he had devised, I don't know, <laughs> devised this big, huge uh, lens mirror to set the sails on fire. I, I don't think it was ever proven, but <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> anyway, whatever, whatever the, the general, the Roman general, Marcellus, knew that Archimedes was there. They say, it has to have, be a genius in there doing all these kind of weapons. And, and he told his soldiers, whatever you do, don't kill Archimedes. But the story goes that Archimedes was in his tent, not worried about the invasion, and doing some circles in the sand, uh, geometry figures, and the soldier came in and said, told him to stand up, and he didn't. Probably because he didn't hear him, or he was so much concentrated in his math, and he killed him. And it's, uh, if you look on the web, you'll find a hundred different uh, drawings of, of the incident of the, the death of Archimedes. Sophie Germain said she was moved by the death of Archimedes. That's when she decided to become an mathematician. I will talk about her later, later on. Okay, now I will show some figures, some uh, portraits of mathematician, and you tell me if you feel like you would like to join them. Uh, you recognize maybe this guy. He's a great mathematician, Tobias <laughs> Strass. Seems very really serious about math. <laughs> no laughing matter, we should say. And I guess we should understand that at that time, you know, they did take pictures, they took portraits, and it, that was how it was. You had to be very serious. Not just like if you're trying to get your Canadian passport and take a picture, you have to be dead serious. You want to laugh, but you, know, you have to be serious. That's why I was not. But there's no reason why today, even in 2009, this Apple Price. Uh, Mikhail uh, Romov, a uh, French Russian, actually. Uh, he doesn't seem so happy. Well, they took the, they, that's the picture they, they used for the, when he got the prize. Uh, I think they, um, they could have used another picture, but I'll show you in a minute. Uh, but it's more interesting to see pictures like this. Terence Tao, Fields Medalist in 2006. You feel like you want to go talk to this guy, you know? <laughs> you feel like you want to join him. Uh, or very recently, last month, Yves Meyer was, uh, this is a French mathematician, who got the Adam Prize in 2017. Uh, very uh, enthusiastic uh, person, at least in this picture. Uh, how about this picture? Miriam Mirza Kani, uh, Iranian, the first woman to win the Fields Medal, 2014. Re remember, it started in 1936, this medal, awarded in four years. And she worked in geometry. And uh, interestingly, she's an Iranian, and she did all her undergraduate studies in Iran. And then she moved to, to California. She works at Princeton, I think. Uh, so that's a model for our girls, for one. And uh, let me go back to Romov. Remember, I showed this picture. Why did they choose this picture? It's <laughs> not a good picture. Anyway, something like that more enthusiastic person. Okay, and other mathematicians, really good mathematicians, dare to be very exuberant. Uh, nowadays have changed. We're, you'll see we're very far off from uh, uh, the wise tracks picture. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you the picture of Cedric Milani. Do you know Milani? He's a French guy who got the Fields Medal in 2010. And he does a lot of outreach. And he did, except he posted this picture, in the Tangent magazine last month. This is the picture. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice way to say he's working on the partial differential equations for one. And, and that's in the, in the magazine. I don't say everybody should do that. But um, you, you get the point. That we should 
show a little bit more bright side of mathematics through our people. Okay, and mathematicians have a life too. And we don't talk about that very much, and we should. Let's start with Einstein. He's a good violin player, and maybe you don't know, but every event he would go to, he would always ask if he could play the violin. That was very part of his life, and you have testimonies by him, written testimonies about pleasure he has in doing music. So, so this is very human. Okay, Alan Turing. Uh, there's a movie on him, a recent movie, a very good movie. Uh, he basically invented the computer, <laughs> essentially, with uh, von Neumann and others, but I mean, he, he was at the very basis of it. And uh, he uh, helped crack the Enigma machine, you know, during World War II, the, the Germans were using this uh, kind of typewriter, which was a, a, a kind of radio to communicate with other Enigma machines. And they cracked out message from the, the German Marine. He was in charge of the Marine, uh, so all the, the boats and the, the, the U-boats, thousand of them, I think, were built. And uh, they cracked all these uh, uh, message, secret messages. And he ran the marathon in two hours and 46 minutes and three seconds. Uh, at that time, the, the winning time for the Olympics uh, in 1948 uh, was uh, two hours and 34 minutes. And this guy was the best British runner. He could have gone to the Olympics. The second British runner was three hours and two minutes. And he said, and you'll see, you can read testimony by uh, Turing, he said he needed to run, to run, to get, off, get the pressure off. He was working all day uh, on his math, and he felt that by running, he could be, uh, get the, the pressure out of himself and relax his brain. These are interesting. Uh, this other one, this is a, a Canadian-American who won the Fields Medal in 2014. He played this double drum I didn't know about. Uh, in my search, I, uh, research, I found this. Uh, he's a, uh, it's a South Asian uh, pair of drums. Another one is uh, Ken Ono, Japanese-American, does triathletes, no, pretty big races. And he says, I'm free to imagine crazy ideas while I'm floating on the trail of my mountain bike. He's a specialist of Ramanujan, and he helped, if, I don't know if you've seen the movie on Ramanujan, He's a, he was a consultant, and he helped Jeremy Irons and everything without explaining what the kind of math that Ramanujan was doing. Okay, let's talk about the process of mathematical discovery. Well, uh, mathematicians are human beings, they think a certain way, and they obtain their results. Now, how do they do it? Okay, I'm not an expert in the area, but I will talk about this book of Jacques Adama. Have you heard of Jacques Adama? He's a French uh, mathematician. He proved the prime number theorem, along with, no, not alone, but separately from uh, uh, Jean-Charles de la vallée Poussin, which is a Belgian. They both prove the prime number. The prime number theorem says essentially that the number of primes up to x is asymptotic to x over log x. So if you count the number of primes up to 10, you got four of them. You got two, three, five, seven. If you count the number of primes up to 100, you got 25 of them. And so is there a formula that predicts how many you will have, say, to 10, uh, uh, when you count them up to 10 to the 10? Well, it ends up being about x over log x. All math, many mathematicians had guessed this formula should be right. Lejean was one, Gauss was one, but nobody could prove it that the number of primes up to x was asymptotic to x over log x. Well, he did it, and de la vallée poussin did it, based on the results of Riemann. Riemann published his famous nine-page paper in 1859 in which he stated his famous Riemann hypothesis. And his whole goal with this paper, and it's in the title, is to, is to prove the prime number theorem. But he was wrong. I mean, he, he, was wrong, he was right about the result, but he did some errors in the paper. But nevertheless, it's one of the finest papers ever published. And uh, uh, Ademar and de la Vallée-Poussin separately used the ideas of Riemann to establish the prime number theorem. You know, and there was, uh, look, uh, date of birth and uh, date of death. He, there was this thing at the time, 
in the, in the, the 19th century that whoever proved the prime number theorem would live to eternity. <laughs> and see, he didn't listen very much. He almost did. <laughs> um, and, and the same thing for uh, that I've been saying, died at 96. Anyway, he wrote this book, uh, an essay on the psychology of invention in the mathematical field. And uh, he explains in here, there, the mathematical process, and it's very interesting. Um, he says that results are obtained essentially in three stages. The first stage is preparation. Uh, understand this is essentially identifying the problem, understanding the problem, and explore it. Okay, of course, you're given a problem, you can explore it. Maybe you'll solve it right away, at first glance, or after just trying here and there for five, ten minutes, an hour or so, maybe you'll solve it. But most of the time, if it's a difficult problem, you won't solve it. So what do you do? You wait. It, you call it the incubation period. Uh, you part the problem, essentially, you do something else. Maybe you work on another problem. And uh, times you come back to it, and you, you, you leave it there. And the important thing is you let your subconscious mind work on it. And now I'll show you a picture in the next. Uh, oh, it's good that I have these constraints. And the third one is elimination. Without prior notice, the solution emerges all of a sudden. <laughs> and it, I, the, uh, the subconscious, I like this image of the uh, iceberg. The, this, the conscious part is the one that's floating. That's a, an actual iceberg. Uh, and the, the underwater part is the subconscious. And uh, I read. It's interesting, it's interesting to read about icebergs. Uh, seven eighths, about, of course, it depends on the shape and everything, but about seven eighths is underwater of an iceberg. And, uh, well, you, when you're conscious, you work on the problems. But what's bad is that uh, you have these fixations. I mean, we all used to think in a certain way to try certain patterns. And so we're limited, in a sense, with our consciousness. But when we sleep, when we do something else, the subconscious continues working. This has been proven. It continues to work. And at some point, the subconscious knocks out, knocks out, and says, I found the solution. And th this is the Eureka moment. It's because we have this fixation that we need to park the problem. And talk to many mathematicians or scientists, and they, they will agree on that. It's not necessarily when you're sitting in your desk that you do find a solution. Sometimes you're playing tennis, you're going an errand, and he has this, uh, this uh, Henri Poincaré uh, contributed to this book as well, and Henri Poincaré explains that at some day he was working on fusion functions. I won't tell you what it is, I wouldn't know exactly. And uh, he was trying to prove the existence of uh, uh, Fusion functions, and he worked on it for many weeks and did something else. And one day, as he was going on an excursion, as he stepped on the bus, he said, when I put my foot on the step of the bus, it all came to me. He had solved the problem. So he explained it. And Henri Poincaré is no uh, non-trivial <laughs> Okay. Okay, let me talk about a real, real problem. Okay, we should talk about the process of mass discovery. How does it work? Let, let's talk about Fermat's last theorem. I'll start by uh, a statement by uh, Edwards, Harold Edwards. Uh, he's a mathematician and also a historian of mathematics. He says, human reason does not move in straight lines from problems to solutions. You know, there's this perception in the general public that mathematicians are given a problem, they think about it, they solve it. Maybe it takes an hour, maybe it takes a day, maybe it takes a year, maybe it takes 10 years. It doesn't work that way. It goes all, it doesn't go in straight lines. And that's, the, the Fermat theorem is an example. The story of Fermat's last theorem is full of <laughs> hopes and deceptions, you'll see, tormented lives and obsessed minds, bitter rivalries between mathematicians, surprises, unexpected events, and remarkable resilience. I'll show all of these in the, the story. Here goes the story. You know, you, you know it, essentially. Pierre de Fermat, he was a lawyer, essentially a judge. 
and uh, amateurs mathematician. The story goes that he was, uh, since he was a judge, he didn't want to go to uh, parties, official reception, mundane uh, activities, because he wanted to keep his impartial impartiality as a judge. So he came home, and what he do? He did his favorite hobby. He did mathematics. And he, one day he read in uh, Diophantine's book, Diophantine, uh, you know, Diophantine equations is uh, equations uh, where the unknowns are uh, integers, and you try to solve it, like this equation. And, and Diophantine had written in a book that he could uh, obtain uh, the, the, there were infinity solutions to x squared plus y squared equals z squared. And Fermat knew that. He knew exactly how to generate the whole set of solutions to x squared plus y squared equals z squared. But then, he's, of course, his mind went astray and he said, no, what, what if we put an exponent 3 in there, an exponent 4? And then he wrote in the margin, while well, discovered a truly remarkable, well, that was, of course, not in English, it was in Latin. The, they would speak like they would write the Latin at that time. Uh, the margin is too small to the name. Okay, it's not the only time that he did that. He did that several times. Because Fermat would, would make statements, write to people, challenge his friends, and uh, would not give any proofs. The only documented proof that we have for Fermat is the proof that if you take a Pythagorean triangle, that is a right angle triangle with integer sides, then the area of that triangle cannot be a, a perfect square. That he proved entirely using his famous method of infinite descent. Uh, so, yeah, and, he, and, and we know that he uh, later the historians found that he, he, he did have a proof that x4 plus y4 equals z4 does not have a solution, and that's in his method of infinite descent. And some say that he knew the proof for n equals 3, but that's not clear. Euler, Euler was a very brilliant mathematician, the most prolific mathematicians of all time. He wrote so much, and also as a human being, uh, he has a tragic life in the sense that he was, he lost sight of one eye uh, uh, fairly early, and he was completely blind at some point before he reached half of his mathematical production. Half of his results in mathematics were obtained were when he was completely blind. It's just amazing. And, uh, well, and he was a very practical man. He said, okay, first thing he said, he asked a friend of his, Claire O was the exact name, to go search Fermat's house. That was a hundred years after Fermat. <laughs> to go search Fermat's house, because the proof must be somewhere in a piece of paper. And, of course, he didn't find it. And then he proved uh, that uh, the Fermat question didn't have any solution when n equals 3, but there was actually, it's a, it's, there's an error in the proof, like in many proofs of and I, I want to um, do a, a digression here for the sake of our students sometimes that try something and fail and they think, oh yeah, but uh, if I had been a good mathematician, I wouldn't have made that mistake. Well, let me give you an example. Yeah, Rari Manumais. It's, it's totally human to make mistakes. Euler looked at this equation of Fermat, and he, of course his mind also was trying to do generalize. And he looked at the more, <coughs> more uh, elaborate equation with powers of four, but then with four variables instead of three. And he thought, and he wrote, that this, he believed that this equation did not have any solution. But only recently did we find that he was wrong. In 1988, this mathematician, let's see, found a, a counterexample. <laughs> and, 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 and okay, even I checked with my computer if it's right. And uh, that's a 30, uh, uh, 30 digit number, by the way. Yeah. Uh, it was known about 80 years before Malkis that there were counterexamples. Okay, okay, I, okay, okay. But you found you. them all. Thank you for the, yeah, actually he proved that the infinity may yeah. exist, and he had a formula. You're right. Okay, thank you. I didn't know the, this first part. Okay, just to say that Euler uh, is not a god either, although he's a great, great mathematician. Okay, let's go back to Sophie Germain. Okay, we're in 1820. Okay, we were in, in, in the 1700s, now we're in 1820. Uh, Sophie Germain did many contributions to mathematics, and you heard this moving story about her that uh, she felt she wouldn't be accepted if she you know, published a result as a woman, and they wouldn't consider it at the academy, so she used the name of Mr. Leblanc. 
until Legend and Gauss uh, wanted to see that mathematician and discovered she was a lady and they really supported it. That's the nice side of this, the story. Anyway, she proved that uh, the fermoir equation, if there was a solution, then uh, a non-trivial solution, of course, then five would divide the, one of these integers. And that was a major result, a major step towards uh, proving Fermat's last theorem, because it didn't, not much happened between the case n equals 3 and n equals 4. And um, it's interesting because her proof works also for exponents p instead of 5, exponent p such that 2p plus 1 is also, is also a prime. If you look at 2p plus 1 in this case, it gives you 11. So if you work with 7, it doesn't work because 2p plus 1 is 15, not a prime. But if you take p equals um, uh, 11, then it works because 2p plus 1 is 23 is a prime. So, so she, her method essentially worked, for, so she got uh, uh, credit for, for that. Uh, okay, now we're moving a little further down, 1839, Lamé, looks like a very serious guy. Uh, he did prove the case n equals 7. And following an idea of Uvid, Uvid said to him, uh, maybe if you factor, uh, if you use factoring in linear factors, linear factors means degree one. So say x5 plus y5 would be uh, a product of five uh, polynomials of degree one with uh, coefficient in C. Uh, then it should work. And he worked. And he is essentially uh, showed that you could factor that in C for any n, and uh, using some kind of uh, uh, infinite descent method, essentially for Fermat method, it, 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 everything would work out good. That was March 1st, okay? Good thing we have two screens. Same day, right after, at the academy, <laughs> right after Lamé, Uville, Joseph Uville, who had given the idea, said it doesn't work. Uh, all to the embarrassment of Lamé, he said it doesn't work because factorization is not unique. And essentially this gave birth to algebraic number theory as we know it today because we talk about this unique factorization theory. And then came in Kummer, who uh, in 1847 uh, proved that it works if the exponent, uh, we only need to look at the exponent primes of course because we can always boil down to an expression, say if it was 14, you write 2 times 7 in the exponent, and you have x squared to the 7 plus y squared to the 7. You can always bring down to primes. He proved that it would work if p is a regular prime. I won't give the definition of regular prime because it's a little bit too uh, uh, complicated, but it worked for a category of primes. And it's, it's nice because up to 100, almost all of the, the primes are regular. So it worked for all the primes up to 100 except these three. And the hope was say, well, if it works for regular primes, there seem to be a lot, uh, then uh, we would be able to prove that the Fermi equation does not have any solution for infinity many primes. Well, we still have today, we don't, we don't know that there is infinity. We can't prove that there's infinitely many regular primes. It's amazing that they thought that would be kids' play to, to prove that. And, and if you look at it, uh, numerically, uh, the conjecture is that the number of uh, the density of the, of the regular primes is 1 over square root of 2, so roughly 60%, the large part. The irregular primes, those are not regular, which is about 40%, we could prove it's, it's infinite. <laughs> it's a smaller family, and we can prove it's infinite, but we can't <laughs> prove that. The, it's, it's funny the way mathematics go. Then, for, for a long time, nothing happened. And then comes in Paul, Paul Scale. I hope I pronounce this. You don't know if there's any Germans in here. Paul Scale. He uh, was an industrialist, and uh, he was an uh, uh, amateur mathematician. And the story goes that he had a, a bad romance experience. So he decided to commit suicide at midnight, say. And, uh, well, why not go to the library? It's only at midnight that I think it's. So he goes to the library, and he goes and sees this book on Fermat's last year, and falls in love with the problem and tries to solve it, can't solve it, and decide to put in his testament, he leaves aside 100,000 marks, which I read roughly, uh, today would be about a million dollars, for anyone who proved Fermat's last theorem. You get zero money if you don't prove it. 
the same thing as the Riemann hypothesis, the claim that you get one dead end if you prove it. You don't get anything if you don't prove it. But maybe that could be <laughs> argued for. Anyway, uh, so, so immediately, this revived Fermat's last theorem because nothing had happened. And of course, a lot of amateur mathematicians started sending proofs. And it's, it's, uh, I read that uh, in a, in a, a ten-year uh, lab, there were, at that time, about more than 1,000 false proofs of Fermat's theorem published. <laughs> but uh, it did attract, but it, uh, the, the good side, it did attract very good mathematicians to work on. And a lot of good mathematicians failed on it, like Gauss, for one, failed on it. He said he didn't have time to work on it. How to make excuse, but uh, they were, of course, all aware of the problem and tried to solve it. But then it took a long time, and we got uh, Faltings, it's a German, who uh, proved the conjecture more real that there would be only finite number solutions. That was a tremendous. Uh, step forward towards the proof. In other words, if there is, if there are some solutions, there's only a finite number. For a given end, if there are some solutions, there's only a finite number. And he did get the Fields Medal for that. And then, Frey, yes. one year later, 1984. He, uh, I, I didn't spend time in the Shimura, Shimura Tanyama well conjecture. These were two Japanese, um, uh, Shimura first and then Tanyama. They established a connection between essentially algebra and analysis, between elliptic curves and modular forms, functions. Okay? That was the first time that, they, that this connection appeared. And some people talk about the, the Shimura Tanyama well conjecture, that some avoid well, probably well, but I won't get into the politics, so I'm a diplomat, I put all three of them. Um, essentially, it's a very complicated conjecture on elliptic curves, but it uh, it would uh, he suggested that it would imply Fermat's last theorem, and Ribet proved that. Ribet, by the way, he just was just named the president of the EMS so last month or two months ago. He's in the analysis. He, he's interviewed. Uh, he proved that uh, that the the Shimura Tanyama whale conjecture implies Fermat's last theorem. So. At that point, this is when um, Wiles came in. He had done something before, and I will mention it after. That's when, when he saw that, he said, I think I know how to prove it. And uh, he did not prove the Shimura conjecture. But I'll, I'll explain. I'll get to it. In 1993, on June 23rd, that's a nice picture, a very happy mathematician. <laughs> Uh, after a series of three lectures, three at times two hours, I think, lectures at uh, Cambridge, the, he started laid the ground for when, as, as the days were going on, the room was getting packed with people, and even the last day it was journalists, because everybody knew where it was going. He was going to prove the, re the Fermat's last theorem. And in the end, he said, he broke the statement of the Fermat's last theorem, and he has these famous words, now I think I'll stop here. <laughs> But, and, and actually, he didn't prove the Shimura Tanyama well conjecture. He proved the particular case for semi-stable curves. He proved, and that was enough to imply the Fermat's last theorem. But that's not the end of it. <laughs> that's not how mathematics works. In 1994, even at the end of 1993, people had doubts. Even as he was stating his result, Jean-Pierre Serre, for one, had doubts. He said, well, we need to check. You know, it's 200 pages proof. We need to check. So flaws started to be found in the proof uh, provided by Wiles. And even, okay, now we have cruel words. Faultings, he's the one that proved that uh, there was only a finite number solution. He wrote, if it were easy, he would have solved it by now. Strictly speaking, it was not a proof when it was announced. It's pretty cruel. Huh? That's how human beings are, whatever. <laughs> Henri but that's a uh, freshman maybe. Uh, I believe he has some good ideas in trying to construct a proof. But the proof is not there. Uh, to some extent, proving Fermat's theorem is, is like climbing Mount Everest. If a man wants to climb and falls short 100 yards, he hasn't climbed. <laughs> these people are writing these things. Just think of why else? I've done all these interviews on CNN everywhere. 
and then fifth year was congratulating the proof, and I was so wrong. So, comes in one of his former students, Richard Taylor, um, and um, British uh, American, young guy, who I started to work with his former student. What's the use of a former student that you can't work with? <laughs> so, and they fixed it. They fixed the proof, essentially. And the, the, the eureka moment came on a particular day, October 6, 1994. He said, I found it. His wife said, you found it. Is it the theater? No, I found the proof in the firm of last theory. <laughs> and they published two papers. Notice, uh, I know the mathematics is not a trivial journal. Uh, and uh, it was in the same volume, and they had these, um, the first paper is the, the longest one, over 100 pages by Wiles, and the second one is essentially the conclusion, I believe, with uh, Taylor and Wiles. Uh, let me talk about another problem, which is more contemporary in the sense, although it's very much older, the twin prime conjecture. Uh, interesting uh, people in there as well. Uh, twin primes are those consecutive primes uh, or a distance by two, like 3, 5, 5, 7, and so forth, 101, 103, okay. As you go into the list of primes, you find infinite, you seem to find infinity many of them, of course, you can't go to infinity, but as far as you go, you see them. And actually there's empirical uh, counting function of uh, about x over log squared. Remember, up to x, there's x over log x primes. Well, twin primes, so as expected, it's about x over log squared with a constant in front. But we can't prove this infinity many. The twin prime conjecture says that there are infinitely many, and it can be written in this way. The limit of this difference is 2. Now you say, if you can't prove that, maybe you can prove this is 4, <laughs> or 6, or maybe large, maybe 100, maybe we, surely there's got to be a number a lower bound, they, I mean, the, they, we, we keep seeing these distance by two, there must be an infinite many distance by four or six. No, we can't. As of April 2013, we can't even prove that this limit is finite. Could be infinite. That means as far as long, at some point, primes start to distance themselves on and on and on, and they never get close again. And could it be that this quantity is infinite? Then comes in this guy, Yi Tang Zhang, born in Shanghai, uh, pays his PhD in the USA, uh, keeps the books in the subway franchise. He was 40 years old and he couldn't get a job. And he worked in the subway doing the accounting, you know? I saw the subway across the street, but it's not that one. <laughs> it's another one in the US. Finally, 1999, he got a job as a lecturer at the University of uh, New Hampshire, but could not get a job as a uh, uh, staff in the math department. But he had been working for a long time on this twin prime conjecture, and finally, he proved, in 2013, he proved that the limit is bounded. Bounded by 70 million. You say, what? Did you tell me the twin prime conjecture that the limit is two? We're far from that. Yes, we are. But at least we have a bound. And actually, when he, when his paper, when he does that, he doesn't try to optimize his results. So, so right away, the mathematician read his paper. Oh, yeah, yeah, but we can reduce that. Yeah, yeah. To 30 million, to 86 million, and then the ten of, tens of thousands. But then there was kind of plateau here. Couldn't do it. Then comes in, so this, this guy was not so young anyway to get a great results. By the way, he was hired in the end by the University of New Hampshire. He did get a position. By this, this guy, James Menard, much younger, born in England, a Prince PhD from Oxford with uh, Heath Brown, who's great, Roger Heath Brown, great analytic number theorist. Uh, he did his postdoc at the University of Montreal, and he improved, he changed the method of Zhang and got it down to 600. That's interesting complement to uh, the uh, to Zhang uh, result. And now, uh, with all the people working on it, on the web, and the collaborative effort, we down to 246, but apparently with this method, we'll never get down under 120. If we accept some other big conjecture, we get down to 12, because we're so far from it. But that's an interesting history. 
good stuff. <laughs> but outside the classroom, I mean, society has a role to play. And I'm happy to see all these movies on, on, uh, on mathematicians. That's one on uh, Theory of Everything on uh, uh, Stephen Hawking's very nice uh, movie. This one on, on Turing. And if you look at it carefully, and they did get some good consultants in mathematics because there's not, I mean, every, it's, some scenes are over exaggerated, but you know, who was there anyway in that room to, to see how they would react? But mathematically, it's correct. Scientifically, it's correct. Uh, there's this one by uh, the life of Ramanujan, The Man Who Knew Infinity. I chose this picture because you see the picture of Jeremy Irons, He's a famous uh, actor who accepted low pay to work on that movie, to play in that movie because uh, he was convinced it was a good thing and Ken Ono helped as a, as a consultant. And it's a uh, it's very uh, passionate movie. I, I'm sure some kids will be impressed by that and go read about it. And this one, I, I, I must confess, I did not see it. Apparently, it's a very great movie. Uh, I, I, I look forward to, to see it. It's about the women working in the NASA in 1961. They had two strikes against them. Against them, one they were women, and two they were black. At that time, can you imagine <laughs> uh, trying to be uh, rival to the, the white people? I want to talk about this guy because he does a tremendous work in, in uh, outreach of mathematics through his books. And I, I see this talk is about people. And I want to state Adam Jackson in the notices. She writes many critics. And she wrote, Singh is an unpretentious writer with a true appreciation of, I put that, it's for the beauty of mathematics, but from my point is for the passion mathematicians have for their work. So the passion that mathematicians have their opinions and, and so he talks about that and uh, yeah it's amazing and you you probably heard of the Simpsons and then everybody heard about the cartoons the Simpsons you have a book about that he wrote a book about the math in the Simpsons it's amazing all the mathematics that's in there is incredible and and, and that there's a reason for that is that the, the, the team that works on that and many of many of them PhDs from Harvard and everything they're great mathematicians and in one of the scenes, um, Omer, Omer Simpson, is all I'm saying, Omer Simpson is this cartoon. He comes up with this statement. Okay, that was in 1998, three years after Fermat was accepted, the proof of Fermat in 1995 was totally accepted, published, and everything. Everybody was sure it was true. And he comes up with that. And if you do check that in the pocket computer, if you take the, these two terms, write them in the pocket computer at that point. And you take the 12th root, is that what you say, 12th root? You get exactly 4472. But <laughs> digits are missing. And I did it on my iPhone, which is much better. And this is what I got. 4472 with eight zeros and then 705. <laughs> so, but he, he, he got, of course, of course, the mathematicians that came up with that, they knew exactly what they were doing. But they created some curiosity in the mathematical world. A lot of mathematicians wrote, is that true? How did you get that? <laughs> so it's interesting that you see this. Okay, just a word about teachers, because I want to spend in three minutes. <laughs> uh, this is the human messenger. It's very important. And teaching has changed in the past decade, as far as I'm, I can observe. Uh, the teacher is no longer the main source of knowledge. You know, 40 years ago, Teacher had the knowledge, transmitted to the office. Now the knowledge is everywhere. It's on the web, it's everywhere. So he's not no longer expected to trans transmit knowledge. He's more of a guide, a motivator that favors autonomy. And he's a, he has a tremendous power of influence. And a lot of teachers don't know that. They have great influence on the future of their kids for many aspects, not just mathematics, but as human beings. And they should be aware of that. Parents, also part of the equation. And uh, I'm not going to go to all the role of parents, what they should do. But let me just say, just give one scientific data, and I'll give the reference for that, that parents that help, that show interest for the schoolwork done by their children, what parents? Chance of academic success, just not only math, increases by 40%. And I have many references that I choose this one, uh, but uh, this is, of course, statistically. Yeah, so that's when parents know that show interest. It's, it's not mean helping necessarily. Just ask questions. Or, you know, to school or whatever. 
show interest. Okay, we talked about an outreach experience. I do all kinds of things in outreach. I thought I'd show you this one. Is to put, you know, you heard about, uh, when I, when one day I was in Paris, and I go, when I'm in Paris, I go to these libraries. There's one in every street, you know? And I go to the science and mathematics level, and I read the book, I look at the books. And I, I found this book, The Case for Pluto. I forgot the author, but I had it down somewhere. And he talked about the whole history of the planet Pluto, how it was discovered by Locke in 1930. Uh, and uh, and then from there on, what happened? Uh, and uh, in uh, in 2000, so we designed a play on Pluto, uh, and you heard that in 2006, uh, the the, uh, the the astronomers got together and they decided they had found these big bodies around the, the in orbit around the sun, some bigger than Pluto, far very far away. They said, well, come on, should we name the planets? Yeah, well, we got two already. In the, Two more, and then how many want to find? We should define what's a planet. That's a very scientific approach to a problem. And so they established three criteria for having a planet, and Pluto uh, didn't satisfy the third one. So tough luck, you're out of there. <laughs> so Pluto was disqualified as a planet in 2006. But uh, Pluto is uh, now very sad about that <laughs> and wants to regain its title. So though he wants to he gives, makes a plea to the sun to get back his title. Why not? You know? Here in the Democratic Society. And uh, so the other planets come in. Mercury, which is one of the four rocky planets, you know they're, they're close to the sun. Mercury, Venus, uh, the Earth, and, and Mars, they're all rocky planets. And then Neptune, okay, so these rocky planets want Pluto to get back as a planet to regain its title. Neptune is one of the, the farthest gas planets, it's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Uh, Neptune doesn't want uh, Pluto to come back because you can consider, in a sense, Pluto as a rocky planet, although its density is not so high, but it's made of uh, ice and gas, and so it qualifies as a rocky planet. And, and if Pluto became a planet again, it would give back the majority to the rocky planets. Yes, uh, so they, they don't want that. So they argue, of course, uh, mathematically, and we explain all kinds of math concepts, including the Lagrange points, which is very interesting. And the sun must decide on the fate of Pluto at the end of the talk, at the end of the play. And uh, the, these, these are the three actors there. We have several actors playing the sun is Mino, he has to argue. This is Neptune that's arguing against Pluto, Mercury against, uh, arguing for Pluto. And in the end, I can't decide. I mean, the argument's for and against, about the same, same level of uh, credibility. So let's ask the audience to vote. And they have the kids and some picture I'll show is a family thing with the parents and kids uh, Sunday afternoon. And they both, uh, they had to show uh, the, the flyer we had that the green side and the red side. So they, if they showed the green side, it meant now they know why it was green. That means they want Pluto back in, and then they show the red, they don't want it. And depending on the, on the vote, we have two endings. For the play. So that's one thing we do. Just get back quickly to the lessons from the wild story. Uh, at 10 years old, wilds read every Temple's, uh, read, yeah, every uh, Temple Bell's book, The Last Problem, meaning the uh, Fermat Problem. And uh, while I said, I was completely captivated by that, by that story. And in that story, he talks about um, this romantic guy, the work cell, the folk Kel, that he uh, was offering 100,000 marks and so forth. And then he was asking everywhere his teachers about, so he did, as a kid, he worked on the problem and then gave up, didn't find a solution. And then when he heard about Ribet's result, that the uh, Tanya Mashimara whale conjecture would imply last term, <coughs> from what he said, I can, I can do it. And a little later, he, he finally solved it and he got the Abel Prize in uh, 2016. Okay, the morale is the following. I found that in the history of Matthew Croy says, <laughs> Overdramatized accounts of mathematical days have undeniable virtues. <laughs> <laughs> Eric Temple Bell is like that for fun. He romances the mathematicians. He gets people excited about mathematics. So it's, it says it's worth it. Okay, one minute to talk about the tin index. What does tin stand for? Thriving in math. Maybe you would, as an English person, you would find a better word than thriving. But I'm very limited. I learned English yesterday. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> the Tim index 
for me is the percentage of 15 year old Canadians who show enthusiasm for mathematics, okay? It's not those who are going to choose a career in STEM, in math or STEM, not at all. I know politicians and businessmen, when they see me, they say, oh yeah, I, I read this problem, it's, it's intriguing, uh, um, I think I have a solution, and they show me it makes sense and everything. They, like math they appreciate mathematics. They didn't choose that as a career, but they appreciate mathematics for what it was and for what it is. And this is, this is the number. I don't know what the index is. You know, it's something, in percentage, maybe 10, I don't think it's 50%. If you take a class of 15 year olds, I don't think, maybe I'm wrong, I hope I'm wrong. But anyway, the goal is to increase X. And perhaps if we use a more people oriented approach, we can do it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Zikonek, for that delightful and uh, inspiring talk. Some questions. And why else claim the hundred thousand marks? Yes, that, uh, yeah, he got it. He got it. He got it, and apparently it's worth like it was worth like thirty thousand dollars or something. Like that. You wow. can check the figures, but he did get it. Hmm. It's funny that he stayed there all that time. He was just too big, too late to get the Fields Medal, though. Because yeah, that's years. right. Because he was 40, 41. Yeah. You have to be under forty or forty or under. Yeah, forty. Under forty. So you mentioned a bunch of mathematical movies. Um, I mean, a lot of people will think of Good Will Hunting as yeah. favorite math movies. But, but my objection to it is that nobody smiles at that. Ah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> and, uh, but Good Will Hunting is not based on the true story, is it? No. I don't think so. It is based on a true story. It's based on Ramanujan. Uh, but they start a white guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Another one which I did not mention, which is based on a true story, is A Beautiful Mind. Oh, yeah. And the math in there, the outreach part is really great. When when Nash explains his uh, uh, Nash equilibrium in the, in, the, in the bar there, it's very well done. There's a good outreach lesson there. But I, you know, I was short of time. I didn't want to do too much. It's also proof, I guess. The film called Proof. Yeah, the very very dramatized. Yeah, 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 very dramatized. And you see uh, Wiles. Uh, uh, crying, was it, what is it? It's, yeah, it's, 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 it's very emotional. It reminds think of a different movie. That's, it's like, but there's two movies to prove. Yeah. There's yeah. one that actually talks about the distribution of crime. I think that the twin prime projector, although they don't mention it, uh, and it's with a very good actor. Uh, I forget his name. He plays in... Uh, Anthony Hopkins. Anthony Hopkins, yeah. 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 I just want to make a comment about the Tim Price uh, proof by Zan. So the story went, he, uh, he actually graduated from Beijing University, or Beijing University. So he couldn't get a job because his supervisor, he followed his supervisor's work uh, to extend work, but there was an error, a mistake. Oh, yeah. So he couldn't really you know, publish his work, therefore he couldn't get a job. Okay. So he's working, you know, as you said, you know, in a fast food chain. One of his classmates from Beijing University was working uh, for AT&T Bell Life. So he was in the city giving a talk, then have a meeting with him. And he was telling him that the, the kind of work he was doing. And he said, I couldn't solve it. The next day they met again, and then solved it. Right? So he said, this is just amazing. Yeah. So he sent emails or letters to all his classmates working in the U.S. universities, saying we have to find him a job yeah, yeah, in the university. Yeah, yeah. So this guy in the University of New Hampshire talked to his chair, department chair, yeah. say we have to offer him a job. Yeah. But this, no, you cannot just give him a job, an academic job. So he, they offer him a lecture, yeah. a teaching job. That's how. It Which happened. is not as prestigious. The human factor. Yeah. Human factor. <laughs> well, I'd like to suggest that we continue the conversation questions. Uh, and there's a reception here. Um, good things to eat. And let's thank uh, Mr. Thank you. Thank you.
formalize the concept of Yeah, so I said, yeah. Yeah, but they weren't formalized. Yeah. 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 Ye